Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And I'm really excited for today's guest uh, for a lot of different reasons. But before we talk to her, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host, Six Sigma. You know him. You love him. Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And most importantly, if not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Scott Todd, are you ready? I am ready, Mark. All right. Uh, for those of you that don't see Scott's video, he's taken to another level. It's, it's quite upsetting to look at him now. <laughs> Is it the server you want me to shut it off? I mean, like, I don't want to distract you from focusing. The, the only way, the only way I can describe it is remember when the first HD TVs came out and you're like, this is so clear compared to like analog. That's how Scott looks right now. He's in HD and our guests and I look like we're in analog, but let's you look, talk. you guys look fabulous by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so today's guest is Edna Keep. If you don't know Edna, she's the co-founder of 3D real estate, uh, profit in the prairie real estate Investor Group and Multiple Ways of Wealth, a training, education, and membership organization for real estate investors. Over the last nine years, Edna has built her own real estate portfolio to over 437 doors with a value of over $47 million. All except the first two properties were bought with the help of other people's money, joint venture partners. Her husband, Warren, and her own 14 doors personally and the rest of the joint venture partners. Most of these partners are passive investors looking for a great return without being actively involved in generating it. Plus, she, she trains other people how to be and keep. And keep. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? Oh, thank you so much, Mark. I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. By the way, I just want to let all the listeners know today's podcast is sponsored by GeekPay.io, the only set it and forget it system to automate your note collection payments. So learn more, get your first note free at thelandgeek.com forward slash GeekPay. So, Edna, let's rewind the tape. Okay. And how the heck did you wake up one day and play real estate? estate. (laughs) Passive income. Well, you know, I was a financial advisor for years and I sold mutual funds and life insurance and I drank the Kool-Aid. I, that's what I believed in. I believed in, uh, you know, investing in the stock market and uh, all, all that kind of stuff. And then, Uh, After doing that for about 10 years, uh, my husband and I just decided we wanted to try something different. Not because we wanted to get out of mutual funds, but because I was tired of my income being so tied to the stock market. So if the markets were up, I did extra good. If the markets were down, not so good. And I I love the recurring uh, income of it, which was like the trail. They call it trailer fee or service fee. I love that part of it. And I thought, okay, if we're looking at something else, I want something that will give us passive income. Uh, Let's look at some real estate. So we took uh, a class with the Rich Dad Group and uh, we, it was an evening class. And then we signed up for the three day weekend, you know how it goes. And, you know, we thought, yeah, this is definitely something we can do. We thought we'd, you know, buy a few houses. It would supplement our income and then it wouldn't be all over the map. But, you know, once I learned how real estate worked, which was within about within the first year, like I really got to understand it. My favorite class was creative finance. I couldn't sell mutual funds anymore. I, I just couldn't. It just didn't make any sense to me. And, and so within uh, two years from buying our very first property, I sold my financial planning practice and went into real estate full time. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. Scott you- time. What do you, what do you, what are your thoughts? Well, I would I would say that Edna, like for a while, very short period of time, I, I did work for um, I mean many many years ago. I worked for a financial services firm. I took the Series Seven, all that stuff, and it was kind of hard for me because like I I was young, and I'm going there and I'm seeing people and I'm like, hey, you know, I, I'm just repeating the company Kool Aid as you said, right? Like I'm just. I'm just rehashing whatever they said. And, you know, uh, the people I'm talking to had like more money than I did. I couldn't fathom like asking someone to like invest in a bond or a mutual fund, but I did it. And, you know, I I never felt good about it. And then I would go and I talk to these guys and they're like, nah, I'm not going to buy your mutual fund. I only invest in real estate. And of course I'm feeding the company line back like, 
well, you know, real estate, da, 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 you know, the, the, the stock market has gone up over every 10 year period, whatever it is. I forgot the, the line. And, and it, you, you know, we, I think we're so ingrained, like we're so, you know, taught, like this is the model, just follow it, shut up and follow it. That to really stop and think for a second, like, man, there is something else out there. It really does transform your life. And like from, from your perspective, those trailing fees, you know, yeah. Mark, you know, I don't know if you know, but like the, these guys that, that are selling you these mutual funds, uh, the class A mutual funds, et cetera, you know, for every quarter, every month, whatever it is, like you'll notice like some money hits your account. It's your commission for keeping them in that fund. The whole system is designed to keep you in that mutual fund. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I built that up too. I was getting over 120,000 a year just in trailer fees alone. So uh, wow. it was powerful. I loved it. But you know, I got a lot of slack when I decided to leave because people just thought I was absolute crazy. And you know, nobody yeah. was selling their books when I did. Uh, so I got absolute top dollar for it and, um, and never looked back. You know, I, and I also made the deal with the fellow who bought my book that would get paid monthly for four years. So that helped me uh, over the hump because in, in, the, in 18 months, we bought 50 doors. And that gave us a passive income of 5,000 a month. So I knew, to, knew I needed at least another 5,000 a month while, you know, just, just to cover the day-to-day -day stuff while I was building this. So I negotiated that with the fellow who bought my book. And, and then, yeah, and then we've just taken it from there. All right. So Edna, let's get into the, the, the creative financing piece of this and okay. the with your partners, because to buy that many doors that fast, you got to have money. Yeah. So walk us through your model, if you would. Sure. So uh, primarily now at this point in our life, we buy multifamily only. And our sweet spot is between 12 and 36 doors. If we go higher, uh, we have a lot of competition with REITs and stuff like that. But what we can do is we can buy the smaller units one at a time and then package them off, package them up and sell them to a REIT or something like that. So that's kind of our sweet spot. Uh, and, and, and we haven't done that yet. We're still holding on to everything because I love real estate. I love owning it. I love having the passive income. I love having the tenants pay down our mortgage. That's huge for us. Um, but our business model is, is that we'll bring in investors. So say, say on a, on a classic deal, it'd be 50, 50, uh, sometimes it's 60 to us. Sometimes it's 40 to us. It just depends. Um, and what we do is they come in as full joint venture partners and we work to get them paid off as quickly as possible. So we want to return their principal to them as fast as possible. To, so then we share in the cash flow from there. So um, one thing that I learned when I was selling mutual funds is I don't know how, the wealthy people kept saying to me, Edna, if you could find me something that would pay 8% consistently, I'd give you the rest. They would say that to me all the time. And of course it would never happen, right? Every time you think, oh, he had three, three good years in a row, well then boom, it would, it would go away. And uh, so I always kept that in my mind. So what, what we, and, and then plus we got our trailer fees regardless and the mutual fund managers got their payment regardless. If the market turned, uh, paid the investor 12%, well, it probably earned 14 or 15 and we got the rest. But if it was a negative 12%, it was actually negative 15% off your portfolio because we still got paid. Uh, and, right. and I have seen a different business model. So what we do is we pay our investors out first before we share in the profit. So we can't win unless they win. Scott Todd. I mean, uh, you're, you're right. Like, you know, the system is rigged. The system is rigged. Those mutual funds that are rigged, uh, you know, real, real estate, and I think you gotta, you gotta find good operators because there's a lot of people out there that, uh, that just aren't operators. And, you know, so if you have a strategy, if you kind of have developed your sweet spot, I think that's a great, you know, a great resource. But, um, you, you know, like are these people that you're finding, are these people that like that, that are doing these partnerships with you? Are these people in your network? Are these people that you had, you know, established relationships with while you, while you were their financial advisor or these people that are kind of, I'm sure now it's grown beyond that, but are these people that you took with you? You know, uh, I had actually made arrangements with the guy who bought my book 
that there were a few clients I wanted to take with me. There were not a lot. Uh, I, I had about 20 clients that I wanted to take with me. And, uh, and I couldn't do it all at once because I had to find the, the deals and stuff like that. And so he, he was confident enough in his skills that he would keep them. And I was confident enough in my skills that I would take the ones I wanted. So I actually did an event before I left and, and I invited those people out. And I said, uh, out of the, at one point I had 600 clients, but by the time I sold my practice, I, I uh, downed that to about 300. And I said, out of my 300 clients that I deal with, uh, you're the ones I want to take with me. And this is why. First of all, they listened to whatever I said. They, they took my advice. They were easygoing. They were uh, not micromanaging me, all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't always the people that had all the money because sometimes people with all the money, do, they, they just weren't your ideal client. They were hard on you. They were, they were not ideal. So uh, out of those uh, 20, I think only about eight actually came with me. I think I did too good of a job selling them on mutual funds because I think they're all still there. But, you know, just just talking to different people in, yeah, in my network to start with. Um, and when they found out what I was doing, they went, yeah, like that's something that interests me. And I started getting more and more investors like that. So yeah, it started with a few investors from my uh, mutual fund days, but, but not the majority of them. They came after. So, so Edna, from a structural standpoint, and you're working with, you know, outside investors, why did you choose the joint venture route over the fund route? Well, you know what? We actually set a fund up uh, early in my career. As a matter of fact, that was one of the deciding decisions for me to leave being a financial advisor because um, I was wanting to carry my trailer fees on a, co a course as long as possible while I was building the real estate side. Um, but I, uh, I, I, I just got to the point where I couldn't do it. But we... Um, Okay, now I kind of lost my train of thought. Tell me your question again. I was going to. So, okay, so like a joint venture. Joint venture goes to. I, I've got 12 apartment contracts yeah. in Tampa. It's going to cost $3 million, Yeah. right? You're going to put in the $3 million. I'm going to do the work. We're going to split the profits 50 50 or whatever it is. Or, you know, you're going to yeah. put in 600000 whatever it is, right? As yeah. opposed to saying, hey, look, Here's a fund. We're going to raise $20 million and we're going to buy these assets. We're going to take a management fee. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you're an accredited investor, you can do this or however you're going to structure it. So why did you go the JV route over the fund route? Okay. So I now I have to just back up here a little bit. So that, that was actually the reason I decided to leave uh, being a financial advisor. I was approached by a guy who wanted to set up a fund of real estate and uh, I was going to be one of the leaders in that. And so I, I, that's when I gave up my mutual fund license because I couldn't do both. And mm. I, uh, I did end up getting my exempt market license at the time because it helped me with, uh, of course, a, a bigger network again. But you know, the fees and everything else involved in that fund just didn't make it worthwhile. Within three years of us starting that fund, we sold everything that was in there because we couldn't get the financing we needed that we could get personally. We could get, you know, 80 to 85% financing if we bought personally. And through the fund, we could only get 65%. And our interest rate was higher. It was like four and a half percent. And we were routinely getting two, two and a half. So it just didn't work. We had to have other people involved, like um, in, in our, in Canada, it was called Olympia Trust. We had to pay them like 8,600 a year. We had to get audited financials and everything, there was just so many costs. And then also you had to answer to the Securities Commission. You had to write up an offering memorandum. You had to follow your offering memorandum and all of that. And in the meantime, we were still, uh, you know, buying a house here and a house there and doing joint ventures on the houses and, and doing really great. So it wasn't the market. It was the model. So yeah, we got out of that within three years. We were able to get everybody their money back and a return of about 9% not near what we should have been able to get them if we would have done it just in a joint venture model. So then from there, that's all we do going forward, just joint venture models, because you can get uh, really, really good financing. So like I said, with the lender, we can go up to 85% financing. Uh, if we get um, vendor take back, we can go up to 90% financing. And, so and let's, let's, let's define vendor take back. Okay. 
Vendor take back is uh, seller financing. So a lot of, uh, just about every deal that we do, we'll ask for vendor financing or, or for the seller to leave some money in the deal. And we get a lot of them uh, because we know how to ask uh, and give them the benefits. Uh, not everybody goes for it, but lots and lots of apartment building owners do because they drink the Kool-Aid. They love real estate. Most of the time they're getting out of it because they're retiring or, or moving on to different types of deals or wanting to be more of a passive investor anyway. So why not leave your money in, in the solid real estate you already know and understand? Awesome. Scott Todd, you're smiling. <laughs> in HD. I mean, you know, I, in HD. I, look, I mean, like Mark, I mean, I would love it you know, if, if our sellers would own or finance. And in fact, there are some that do, like I've bought land uh, that I've turned around and resold and it's on, it's on owner financing. I've bought it on owner financing, right? Like it's just the way that it is. Uh, you know, and it, it really works magical because, you know, like on, on the deal, like one of the deals that I've done. So, you know, essentially I'm, I'm paying, I think two, two fifty a month, but I sold that land for two ninety five a month, two nine yeah two ninety five a month. So right now I've got a forty five dollar positive cash flow on that one deal. Whoop de do I know forty five dollars is not that much money. You know it's not necessarily gonna you know I, I don't know it's it's like lunch right. It's However, lunch at Panera. Uh, right, but I don't go to Panera too often. So <laughs> I know you think I do, but I don't. Anyway, it's lunch at Panera. That said that thing is going to be paid off in three years. Well, it was three years total. So it's like a year into this thing now, more than that. So it's going to be paid off. My buyer is going to basically pay me an extra three years on this thing. So my positive cash flow goes from, you know, $45 to $295 the minute it's paid off, right? So, you know, it's, it's cool because I'm able to control a 40 acre piece of property literally for $500 now. Yeah. And I sold that thing for $1,000 down. So right there, I doubled my money. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the power of leverage and dealing, you know, dealing with other people's money too. You, you've got a, a, us as the entrepreneurs who do all the work, uh, we have an infinite return because we didn't put any money in the deal. Uh, I will give you an example of one that we're working on right now. We actually bought a vacant apartment building. Um, the last owner had rented it to the same group. Uh, it was like a, a group of disabled adults um, through, through a company. Uh, and, but he'd rented it for 20 years to this group. So when they moved out, they built their own building. Uh, they just wanted to sell it vacant. They didn't want to do all the work. So we bought this property. Uh, we paid 855000 We got a $600,000 vendor take back. Because of course you can't go to a traditional lender and get financing. And the guy understands that he's been an investor. He owns tons of property in our city. And uh, so we got 600,000 from him, 400,000 from an investor. Uh, we're going to uh, refinance it out at one, 1 1.2, $1 1.3 million. So we'll make a couple hundred thousand dollar profit in a six month period and all financed by somebody else. Amazing. Amazing. So, so Edna, what's some of the worst advice you see or hear given in your area of expertise? You know, some of the, some of the biggest mistakes I see people making is, you know, they'll buy their first two, three, four houses and they'll decide to property manage it themselves. So deal with tenant, tenants and toilets is what I call it because they mm -hmm. want to save themselves that couple hundred bucks a month. And that is one of the biggest mistakes they can make because first of all uh you'll get so frustrated dealing with tenants and toilets that you'll quit <laughs> and and it wastes all your time and you have no time to grow so you have no time to go on and get the, the next deal and the next deal and the next deal because you're too busy saving that 200 bucks a month so that's one of the biggest mistakes i see people do all the time yeah scott how many, how many times do we say like a week can always make more money can't get more time. Get more time. Exactly right. Yeah. You, you can't, man. Like, and, you know, like when you start embracing that and like making decisions based on that, I think that your life all of a sudden becomes much more enjoyable because the little thing, the little things that you kind of take for granted sometimes, you're like, it's just money. 
right? Like li- literally, yeah. like I'm not saying be out there wasting it, but y- you know, like the, the memories you can create with your family and loved ones and y- you know, experiences, if you just follow that mo- model, yeah, yeah, greatly enhances your life. That, uh, you know, that game cash flow, cash flow 101 by Robert Kiyosaki. Okay. So we played that with our kids and my students for years because I love it. It, it totally makes sense. Once you can get your passive income to cover your day-to-day expenses, you're financially free. And, you know, uh, I mean, you're, 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 you can earn more and more money once you get to that point, your lifestyle can change, but that's why it's so, uh, interesting to see who gets out of the rat race first, the janitor, the secretary, not the doctor, not the lawyer, their lifestyle is too high. So, you know, I tell people, follow that model till you get your day-to-day expenses covered, then you can do whatever you want. And that's where you can start making the big, big money because you can actually concentrate on it and you don't have to keep thinking about, you know, putting food on the table. Yeah, no, it's an interesting uh, point that a lot of times we don't even discuss is uh, the lifestyle inflation and how it can really um, sort of be this, this obstacle in to grow real wealth and, and cash flow. And I always often ask people, you know, is there one luxury that you have that you can't live without? Like you just wouldn't be able to live without. So I'm going to ask you, is there one luxury that you own that you just wouldn't be able to live without? Well, I don't own it, but it's my housekeeper. I hate cleaning house. I always have. And I've had a housekeeper since 1992. And I even tell my husband, I give up my truck and I drive a a brand new Escalade. I give up my truck before I give up my housekeeper. I love having a housekeeper. Yeah, no, that's a a really good answer. And and, uh, I, I, yeah, it's interesting. But is there any one one thing that you actually own, like assets? Or- well, uh, well, you know what? My apartment buildings, uh, because my tenants are paying them off. They're, they're a- assets that keep up with inflation. Uh, if somebody would have told me when I was young, because you heard my story, I was a single mom at age 16, lived in subsidized housing. My daughter went to subsidized daycare. Uh, I, I made all of 1200 bucks a month at that time. And if somebody would have told me that at some point in my life, I'd have over... Well, we're, it's between twenty five and thirty thousand a month going in mortgage pay down alone. And so basically, somebody else putting money away for my retirement of twenty five to thirty thousand a month, I wouldn't have believed it. I wouldn't even have been able to understand how that could happen. And that's the lifestyle we're living right now today. And and so yeah, I want to keep those apartment buildings forever. Amazing, amazing. All right, and we're at that point now in the podcast where we're going to put you on the spot. Sure. Ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actual where the art of passive income listeners can go improve their businesses, improve their lives. I think the mentorship has been great, but I'm going to ask you for one more tip. What do you got? Sure. You know, so, so one tip I would take when it comes to earning passive income is hire a coach, somebody who has done what you want to do, not somebody who's just teaching it but somebody who's done what you want to do. That's my number one tip. And that's a great tip. And oftentimes real estate information has like the sleaziest reputation because you see so many of these people that, you know, basically they made a lot of money in 2006 and then they make all their money in teaching. They're not doing deals anymore. And people are like, wait a second, you're teaching me a strategy that no longer works. Exactly. And, um, you know, and it sort of hurts the people that are like the legitimate yeah, um, it does. So, but I think that I, I do think that even so, having somebody, even a bad somebody, is better than having nobody. I because, agree too. You know, even if they they may not know everything, if they're not buying today, they may not know all the new rules and stuff because rules do change all the time. You know, I even have uh, I, you know students that come to me with new stuff that that's come out maybe through a lender or through, through a networking event they went to that they're teaching me. So I'm continuously learning. Uh, and, and you can't, you can't close yourself off and think, you know, everything, cause there's always more. Uh, so yeah, working with somebody who knows, 
uh, even if they've done it in the past, like, like I say, don't take your advice from the father-in-law that's never bought a property in his life other than his own home. At least talk to the neighbor who owns a, who owns a rental property, you know, even if it's only one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Oh, uh, so many, so many tips, like so many opportunities for tips and, um, yet yeah, how do you choose? <laughs> so, uh, Mark, I would say that, uh, a book that I've really, um, started reading, like I went back and reread it, um, again, and I think it's still re really relevant is, uh, the art of social media power tips for power users. And in Art this book, uh, it's, right, let me uh, get this book. Right yes. Here. By, by, uh, guy Kawasaki. And if you don't know about guy, like this is a guy who worked for Apple. He was their chief evangelist officer at Apple. And he's gone on to, I mean, you know, some of his other companies like Canva, you, you know, Canva, the place, oh, you sure. go, the website you can go to. So he's like, he's like promoting them. This guy has social media down. Like, he is a big sharer of, of information. Uh, he's just a wealth of knowledge. And just to be able to take his strategy and look at it and put it into practice, really, really cool. So this art of social media, is that right? The book is called The Art of Social Media, Power Tips for Power Users. All right. Now, should I get the audio or the book? I think the audio is fine. The audio is okay? Audio. Yeah, audio is good. All right, done and done. You, you use the credit. I'm going to get it too. I have not read that. That sounds very interesting. Uh, I'm going to get it. <laughs> um, all right, awesome. Well, my tip of the week is probably the best tip of the week. Not just because it's mine, but because it's to learn more about multifamily and how to start building your passive income in this incredible niche and have other people use other people's money is ednakeep.com. We will have a uh, link to her site, ednakeep.com. And, um, and please go there and, and learn more. Uh, Edna, are we good? Yes. And you know, uh, if you want a free, free resource over and above the website, uh, I do do a free training by video. Uh, it's at just training.ednakeep.com. So if people are thinking they might be interested, but just don't know enough about it to find out, that's also a good place to start. So yeah, your guests can and uh, guests and audience can uh, go through that as well. Great, Scott Todd, what are you gonna say? Nothing, all right, well I wanna just thank all the listeners and remind them, look, it ain't easy getting guests. It's even harder getting really good guests. And the only way, the only way we're gonna get the quality of guests like in Edna Keep from ednakeep.com is if you do us three little favors, it really helps. You got to subscribe. Make sure you subscribe. Subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit. So please do that. And um, Scott, are you ready for this? I think oh, you're, we're you're ready. Let's go, Mark. Ready? All right. In HD. One, two, three. Let freedom, freedom ring. ring. See, the, hey, that the was dude, pretty good. No, it's horrible because the lag think, with your fancy video. I didn't see the lag. I thought we were good. Edna, lag or, or good? I think you should do it again. See? Oh, no, we're out. <laughs> we're done. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. And uh, thanks everybody. And uh, we'll see everybody next time. Okay. Thanks guys. Thanks.